Hey, let's turn in our Bibles to Psalm 139. And the title of my message is God is Now Here. You know, I have noticed that as I get older, and I am certainly getting older, that I, I, I am forgetting things more and more. Now, there have been times I've been looking for my reading glasses and I find they're on my head. That's kind of embarrassing. There's times I'm looking for something that I've misplaced and then I forget what I was looking for while I'm still looking for that thing. And then there are times when I forget where I park my car. I went into some parking structure and I can't remember if I'm on level one, two, three, or four. So you walk around with your little remote control thing, you know, pressing the button, hoping the alarm will go off. And, you know, and the sad thing is I see other people doing the same thing. So I guess I'm not alone out there. So, you know, I need reminders. Sometimes I'll jot little notes to myself. I'll even ask someone, remind me that I need to do thus and so. And then we have reminders that we carry with us. For instance, on my finger I have a ring. It reminds me I'm married. I, I don't need only this ring to remind me. There's also a woman that's been living in my house for 35 years to remind me as well. Uh, but uh, then in the church we even have communion where we are instructed to receive those elements uh, that remind us of the sacrifice of Jesus where he said, this do in remembrance of me. Why do I need to be reminded? Because I forget things. And the Bible is a book that is filled with reminders. In fact, not only that, it's a book that's filled with repetition. It tells us the same thing over and over and over again. Why is that? <clears throat> because we forget things. In fact, what I found as I tend to remember what I ought to forget, and I forget what I ought to remember. Why is my mind still filled with useless trivia that I have no use whatsoever for? I can't get rid of it no matter how hard I try. When, I think to myself, did I consciously memorize the lyrics to stupid commercials <laughs> and songs I didn't even like, but yet they just play like you push a button and on they go. And how is it that I cannot remember verses that I have actually committed to memory at times. So what I find that I need to do is remind myself and refresh my memory over and over again. In fact, Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3, we need to have our memories refreshed. In short, we need to think. And there is no more important area to think in than our faith. Because what we believe about God and what he says about himself is the most important thing we could focus on and think about. What you think about God has everything to do with how you will live your life. Your view of God will determine how you will react to what comes your way in life. And I don't know what you're facing right now. I don't know what you're going through right now. Maybe you've come here today with, with great concerns, anxiety. Uh, worry or fears. Maybe you feel as though you're all alone. You're adrift at sea and there's no one to help you. Maybe you've even wondered at times if God is even there. You feel as though He has somehow abandoned you or let you down. And I want you to know that nothing could be further from the truth because God is here with you right now. And I want to tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. And I want you also to know that God is been here and been there for our family as we've gone quite frankly through the worst tragedy of our lives and that is the uh, unexpected departure of my oldest son to heaven and it's something we still are going through. It's something that we are depending on God to get us through but I want you to know that God has walked with us through it and as we have drawn on things that we know are true, found in the Bible, that foundation has sustained us and helped us to keep our spiritual equilibrium. And I want you to know what he says so you can do the same when crisis comes in your life as well. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, he comes alongside us when we go through hard times because before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. Listen, 
God has been there for me and now we want to be here for you and share with you some of the great things we have learned. I think sometimes in life the temptation is to think that I'm on my own. That, that I'm out there without any help whatsoever. That God is nowhere to be found. I heard the story that took place many years ago of a man who was a hardened atheist. This man had been successful in life. He had a nice home, a wonderful family, a wife, a daughter. He had good health. And he just had no place in his life for God. Well, one day his health took a turn for the worse. And it didn't look like he was even going to make it. And he became harder and harder against God. And soon he was on his deathbed. So his wife called the pastor at our church to come visit her husband, hoping that he could perhaps lead her atheist spouse to faith. And when that man saw that pastor walk into the room, he began to scream profanities at the preacher and he yelled at his wife and said, don't you ever let that preacher in my house again. I don't want God. There is no God. And he said, in fact, I want you to take out a piece of uh, poster board and I want you to write these words on it. God is nowhere. And I want you to put it at the base of my bed so every morning when I wake up, I can see that sign God is nowhere. Well, this man had a little daughter. She was the apple of his eye. But uh, though he loved her, he didn't want her influenced by his wife's faith. He wouldn't even allow his wife to send his daughter to school because he was afraid that she would hear about Jesus there. Well, as his health got worse and worse and it looked like he wasn't going to make it, it was decided the little girl should be taken out of the house because they feared that she might get what her father had. And the pastor and his wife offered to take the little girl in. So she was living uh, in this home and for the first time uh, seeing a family pray together and read the Bible together and go to church together and her little life was changing. Not only that, but the pastor's wife began to teach her how to read. So unexpectedly the father's health began to improve. And so the little girl was allowed to just go and spend a few moments with her father. He was still weak and she climbed up into his bed. She threw her arms around him. She hugged him and kissed him and said, I love you daddy. And he said, well I love you too. And he says, now where have you been? What have you been doing? She said, well I've been going to church and reading the Bible and hearing about Jesus and I've even been learning how to read. And the father said, oh read? Well, surely you couldn't know how to read too much at this point. You've only been gone a short time. She says, no, Daddy, I can read now. She says, oh, can you? Well, why don't you read that little sign there at the base of my bed? What does that say? And the little girl looked at it for a moment, and she sounded the words out, G-O-D-I-S, God is. And she thought about it. She goes, Daddy, I've got it. Your sign says, God is now here. And then she said, you know what, Daddy? God is here and He's been with you this whole time that you've been sick and we've been praying for you. Suddenly the father choked up. He asked the mother to take the little girl from the room. And he just was filled with sorrow over the way that he had lived. And he asked God to forgive him and he believed in Jesus Christ. You see, that's uh, all how you look at things. Some say God is nowhere. But in reality, God is now here. But who is this God that is now here and always has been. This is something that every believer needs to know because it seems to me that in the church today there is a rising biblical illiteracy among professed followers of Jesus. Though maybe our numbers have never been higher, it seems our Bible IQ, if you will, has never been lower. For instance, a recent Gallup poll, a, a poll was done and it revealed that half of Americans who describe themselves as Christians do not believe that Satan exists and fully one third are confident that Jesus sinned while he was on the earth. Now we're this is like Christianity 101 these things. When the Bible teaches there is a literal devil and Jesus the Son of God never sinned. Yet so many people who profess to believe, uh, be believers don't understand this. Another 25% dismiss the idea that the Bible is accurate in all the principles it teaches. And so the pollster concluded, quote, growing numbers of people now serve as their own theologian in residence. One consequence is that Mer Americans are embracing an unpredictable and contra contradictory body of beliefs, end quote. So 
Here's what we need to do. We need to put our thinking caps on and realize that Christianity is a reasonable faith. It's a logical faith. You do not have to check your brains at the door when you choose to be a follower of Jesus Christ because God says in Isaiah 118, come let us reason together, says the Lord. Or another translation, God speaking says, come let us argue this out, says the Lord. The Lord says, let's get this right. Get this straightened out in your mind. Understand these things. We need to think and act biblically, not emotionally. Far too many people today emote when it comes to God. They feel, they don't think. They'll say things like, well, I think, or I feel, or other things like, well, I don't believe in a God of love judging anyone, or, or my God would never do thus and so, or the all-time classic, well, I'm not into organized religion. I'm just a really spiritual person. Wow. Listen, we need to think carefully about these things. We need to study God. And you know what the study of God is called? Theology. And we neglect theology at our own peril. Because experience is never to be the basis for theology, but rather sound theology should be the basis for our experience. C.S. Lewis gave this warning years ago. If you do not listen to theology, that will not mean you have no ideas about God. It will mean you have a lot of wrong ones. So that is why we're going to take some time in this new series that we're calling Essentials to talk about theology without apology. We're going to break it down in an understandable way, take away truth, if you will, that you can apply in your own life because the way that you think and believe will affect you in the way that you live. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 4.16, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you'll save yourself and your hearers. Watch your life and your doctrine. Now someone will say, oh, Greg, get off of it. Well, yeah, you know, doctrine, schmoctrine. I just love Jesus. Can we set these things aside and, hey, you know, I, I just love the Lord. Well, that's a nice sentiment, but here's the problem. What if you end up loving the wrong Jesus? I mean, if you're like some of these people that were polled I mentioned ago, if the Jesus you love, in quotes, sinned while he was on earth, what kind of a savior is that? If the Jesus you love is not the Jesus of the Bible, then effectively you are an idolater worshiping another God. Let's make sure we're worshiping the right God as he has presented to us in the pages of Scripture. I mean, what would you think about a pilot who got into the cockpit of the plane you were a passenger on and you heard him say on the intercom, Fuel schmuel. Let's just see how far this bucket of bolts will go. What would you think about a doctor who would say something along the lines of, hey, let's just get the scalpel out and start cutting and see what happens. No, you would be alarmed. Yet at the same time, here is something far more important than our flight or our operation. Something that will determine our eternal destiny and yet so many will treat it so casually, effectively making up the rules as they go. And I want you to know, as I've already said, that what you believe will enable you to get through the challenges and the difficulties of life. And there's no better place to start than with God himself. What does the Bible say about God? We must have a proper understanding of the character and nature of God. It was A.W. Tozer who said, nothing twists or deforms the soul more than a low or unworthy conception of God. And I think that's true. If you don't understand who God is, if your view of God is warped, it's going to affect you in the way that you live. So let's begin now for a moment were the words of the Apostle Paul that we reflected upon when we were in the book of Acts recently. You remember he was on that tempest-tossed sea. And it looked as though everyone on board the ship was going to die. But the Lord came to Paul and assured him he would have a safe arrival in Rome. 
So Paul was able to stand before all the people there and say, last night an angel of the Lord God uh, whom I serve and to whom I belong said to me, don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar and God has given you all those who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I believe God. It will be as he said. We just sang that together. I believe God. And folks, we too live in a storm-tossed world. Global terrorism, rampant immorality, a recession, we don't know where these things are going to lead. These are uncertain times and we need a real certainty that will help us to get through it because though times and circumstances change, God never does. All but God is changing day by day. The Bible says in Malachi 3.6, God speaking, I am the Lord, I do not change. So listen, when you believe God, that doesn't necessarily change your circumstances. Well, sometimes it will. But more often than not, it will change you. It will help you to view your circumstances properly. I believe God. So let's begin with a no-brainer for point number one. But we have to say it because it's at the very foundation of this series we'll be doing together. God exists and is the creator of the universe and mankind. God exists and He is the creator of the universe and mankind. Now I could spend the rest of this message and many other messages trying to prove to you the existence of God. I know that there are militant atheists who have done their level best of late writing books to undermine the faith of those who uh, choose to believe the Bible. But most polls would reveal that Americans by and large believe in God. I don't know that there are that many real atheists out there. And even those who claim to be atheists really are probably agnostics at best. And even those who claim to be atheists still have their moments of doubt, don't they? So I don't know how many out there are who are hardened in their belief that there is no God whatsoever. Though I did hear of a group of atheists that were complaining about the fact that they didn't have a holiday. They thought it was unfair in our pluralistic culture uh, that Christians had holidays and they didn't have any. I mean, after all, Christians, we have Christmas. And we have Easter and atheists, they don't have a holiday. But wait a second. You know, atheists do have a holiday. They just don't know it. It's April 1st, which is April Fool's Day, you see, because <laughs> it's National Atheist Day because the Bible says only the fool has said in his heart there is no God. You know, it's interesting. The Bible never tries to prove the existence of God. Have you ever noticed that? The Bible just starts with these words. You know them, Genesis 1-1. In the beginning... It's like in the beginning, God. It just assumes the obvious. It assumes that people know this is true. Frankly, I think it takes way more faith to believe there is no God than it takes to believe that there is one. In the beginning, God. In the beginning. Now, people are willing to accept the premise of a God, but it seems today that we want a God in our own image. As Voltaire said, quote, God made man in his image and man returned the favor, end quote. And that's what we have largely today. Not a generation that necessarily does not believe in God, but rather a generation that believes in a God of their own making. Not even one we can all agree on, but we can sort of customize our God. You know, we live in a day of information on demand. Some of you are, are too young to know this, but do you know on television there used to only be three channels? <laughs> and did you know that we got our news at six o'clock and you would tune on the television and find out what was happening in the world? We didn't have information on demand. Our TV sets weren't even color. Now there's like 5,000 channels and still nothing good to watch. I mean, I just flip, 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 flip. I can't believe it. 223, 224, 567, 500. What? This is crazy. And still, I don't see anything that interests me for the most part. But we live in a new age, you know. It started off with, oh, now you can, you know, record things at home in something called the VCR, you know. And, of course, none of us ever did figure out how to program those crazy things. <laughs> they all perpetually would blink 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock all day long. But then, you know, we move forward a little bit and now we can 
uh, record with the you know TiVo technology and DVRs and burn it even onto DVDs and now with MP3 devices we can take the information and we can download it. The new trend in music of course is not to go and buy a CD anymore but to just download it from iTunes or some other music service and you can be listening to it and then you can burn it on a CD if you want to do that. It's information on demand. I can hear or see what I want to see and hear when I want to see it. If I need information I just go out on the internet or do whatever. So we sort of apply that, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes to God. You know, we have our iPod and we have our iPhone and now we want our iGod. He's personalized. He's customized. I, God, does what I want him to do. I, God, says what I want him to say. I edit out the tracks I don't like and leave the ones that I do. That's what we're doing today. But that's not the way to know God. We don't mold God into our image. He wants to mold us into his. In the beginning, God. That's where it starts. Not in the beginning, you. In the beginning, God. And if I eliminate God, I've got a big problem. In the beginning, what? Well, in the beginning, a uh, mass of gases floating in space. Well, that's not the beginning. Where did the mass of gases come from? Where did space come from? Sooner or later, everyone gets around to asking the question, where did God come from? And that's not an easy question to answer because the Bible doesn't tell us where God came from. It just tells us God is. It just says, in the beginning, God. You see, God has always existed. He did not come from something. He was not invented or created. He has always been there. God has no beginning, nor does He have an end. In the beginning, God. In the beginning. Simple as that. But who is this God that has always existed? Now this is hard. Because we're trying to wrap our finite minds around the infinite. It would be like trying to explain Hawaii to my granddaughter Lucy. I've never told a Lucy story, you see. <laughs> I, I tell Stella stories, now my other granddaughter, and people say, when are we going to hear a Lucy story? Here's your first official Lucy story. <laughs> okay. Lucy Christopher Laurie. Now, it's really not much of a story. It's just more of an illustration. But, you know, Lucy, she's growing, she's developing, and she's more alert, more aware. And uh, you can't really communicate with her for the most part, a little bit. Now, you know, it's interesting. The most important years of a child's development are the first five years. And studies have been done that will show even before you can verbally communicate with a child, you are, you know, communicating with them. You're getting information across to them. If they're nurtured, if they're loved, if they're cared for, if they're neglected, this is going into the psyche of a child before they understand a single word you've spoken. So a lot of the communication is done with inflection of voice, with a softness of touch, uh, with the expression on a face. And we all talk to babies the same way. You don't walk up, hey baby, what's up? <laughs> baby just looks at you. You say, hello baby. Hi, baby. Woo. You know, and you make little noises and they kind of look at you and you smile and they'll smile and, you know, you interact with the baby. Now, there's only certain things you can tell a baby. Now, Stella, two and a half years old, I can communicate certain things to her. She can only go so far in her comprehension, so I might illustrate it or draw something to help her. But Lucy, she only hears inflection and tone and so forth, and so it's really hard. How could I explain Hawaii to Lucy? Lucy, today I want to tell you about Hawaii. The sky is blue and the water is warm. She has no idea what I'm talking about. So here we are trying to grasp God. We're trying to make God fit into our mind and into our logic. Sometimes He does. Often He does not. This is not a cop-out. It's not an excuse. It's a simple acknowledgement that I will never fully be able to comprehend God, this side of heaven. But it has been said. If God were small enough for my mind, He wouldn't be big enough for my needs. And one day I'll comprehend God. One day I'll understand everything about God because the Bible tells me uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, we don't see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, 
peering through a mist, but it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then. We'll see it as clearly as God sees us, knowing Him directly just as He knows us. Now having said that we cannot fully comprehend God, let me also add, we can know God. And of course, knowing God is the essence of being a Christian. Uh, John tells us that this is eternal life, that you may know the one and only true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. And then the Apostle Paul said, my determined purpose, my determined purpose in life is to know him. That's why we're on earth, to know God. And then as an expression of that, to honor, to glorify and magnify God with our lives. So what is God like? Does God know literally everything? Can God be present all around the world at the same time? Does God have limitations to his power? Are events in our universe random or is there a plan? And does God care about someone like me? Let's read Psalm 139 now. Let's just read a few verses. We're gonna learn three important takeaway truths about God today. Psalm 139 verse 1, O Lord, you've searched me, you've known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and you're acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word of my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You've hedged me behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. In this Psalm, Psalm 139, I'm gonna learn three vital things I need to know about God. Number one, God is omnipresent, which means He's present everywhere. Number two, God is omnipotent, which means He has unlimited power. And number three, God is omniscient, which means He is all-knowing. Let's start with the first one. God is omniscient, which means God knows everything. Let me read Again from Psalm 139, this time from the New Living Translation. So just listen. Oh Lord, you've examined my heart. You know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my every thought when it's far away. You chart the path ahead of me and tell me where to stop and rest. Every moment you know where I am. You know what I'm gonna do. You know what I'm gonna say even before I say it. Wow, impressive. I don't even know what I'm gonna say before I say it. And there have been times when I've said things that I wish I hadn't said. You're probably sitting there saying, I'm experiencing that right now listening to you. No, uh, but we've all had that happen. But God knows what I'm gonna say before I say it. From this and other verses, we learn that God's knowledge is as eternal as He is. What God knows now, He has always known and will always know. Let me repeat that. What God knows now, He has always known and will always know. See, God doesn't learn new things. Uh, he doesn't forget what He has learned like we do. Uh, we learn new things, but God never does. God knows them from the beginning. Now, scientists tell us we never forget anything. I have a hard time believing that because it seems like I forget a lot. But uh, Think Magazine says that the brain can store enough data to fill several million books. And it's estimated that in a lifetime a brain can store one million billion bits of information. And you wonder, is that really true? But there have been times when certain things have triggered memories that go back so many years. And I'm surprised I still remember a certain thing so vividly. But listen, God, He remembers everything at all times. He, he, there's never a lapse in his memory. He never forgets someone. Sometimes I'm seeing someone that I've known for years and I blank out. I can't remember their name. The sad thing is I'm talking about my wife now and it's <laughs> embarrassing. Is your name Betty? Uh, no. But can you imagine if God had a lapse of memory and you are who? I forgot all about you. No. In contrast to that, God knows everything including what is going on in the creation. God knows about every star in the sky. You know, here's an interesting thing, you know, going back a number of years. 
the astronomers of the day determined that they knew the number of stars in the sky and they laughed at the Bible, this unscientific book that actually says the stars are innumerable. But then as they developed more powerful telescopes, they realized there were more stars than they had thought and there were actually more galaxies than they had thought. And as time went by and they developed more and more powerful telescopes and we were involved in space exploration, we discovered that the stars are innumerable just like the Bible said. But having established that fact, it is also true that the Bible says, Psalm 147 verse 4, God determines the numbers of the stars and He calls them each by name. <laughs> Boy, I'd run out of names fast, you know, because astronomers estimate there are about 100,000 million stars in the Milky Way alone. And outside of that are millions and millions of other galaxies. God knows every star and everyone has its own name. That's vast knowledge. But now let's personalize it. Not only does he know all of this information, he knows about you. Jesus said, the very hairs of your head are numbered. Now in my case, that's, you know, what is it, eight, nine? <laughs> you know, very imaginatively moved around, I guess. For some of you, you know, it's a lot more work. But uh, the Bible says that God knows about every little bird that falls to the ground. I mean, think about every little bird. And Jesus brought those two points up to bring this to our attention. He said, so don't be afraid because you're more valuable to God than a flock of sparrows. This awesome God who created the universe and numbers of stars is interested in you. What bothers you, what concerns you, what brings heartache to you, which brings tears to your eyes, it's of concern to God. For the psalmist said in Psalm 56, 8, you keep track of all of my sorrows. You've collected all of my tears in your bottle. You've recorded each one in your book. So whatever you're facing right now, the Lord knows about it. He's concerned about it. If you've made sacrifices for Him, working for His kingdom, giving financially, serving Him in some way, shape, or form, God is aware of it. And you will be rewarded for Jesus said, your Father who sees you in secret, will reward you openly. Not only is God aware of what concerns you, but He is aware of the wrongs that are done in our world today. We're told in Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. How could He punish evil otherwise and reward good works? Not one single thing occurs in any place without him being aware of it. He sees everything that happens everywhere and he sees everything happening in our lives. He doesn't just see you, he sees through you. Of course, when Jesus walked this earth and he was God in human form, he would often read the minds and hearts of people which drove him crazy. He'd say, why are you thinking thus and so in your hearts? They go, how do you know that? I'm glad I don't have that ability. I think it'd be kind of depressing to know what people really think about me, you know? Stand at the back door, shaking hands with people. God bless you, Pastor Greg. That was a great message. And they're really thinking, that message was so lame. <laughs> and you really are ugly in person. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what we think? But... God can see right through us. He knows every thought that we have. And this is why it's so preposterous to believe that we can hide something from God. You think you're so clever. I've done this little sin or I, I've moved this money around or, I, or I've hid this thing or, or covered up this thing that I did. Everything will be made known. That which is done in secret will be shouted from the mountaintops. So if you've lived a godly life, that will be proclaimed. If you've lived an ungodly life, that too will be revealed in time. But here's the thing to consider about God knowing all things. He knows what's going to happen before it happens. Nothing catches God by surprise. God doesn't say, whoa, 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 whoa. Where would that come from? God knew it was going to happen. And that's because God dwells in the eternal realm. Isaiah 46.10 says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. My purpose will stand. I will do all that I please. God knows the end from the beginning. I barely know the end at the end. I forget what happened. 
When God says he knows the end from the beginning, that means it's not a stretch for him to predict what will happen in the future. For instance, if I, if I told you I'm going to reveal to you who won the Super Bowl, and I told you the Steelers won in a last minute upset, would you think me a great prophet? No, you would think of me as someone who probably watched the Super Bowl. It's not a big deal. But see, for God, He can predict the future as well as we can speak of the past. Let me restate that. God can predict the future more accurately than I can describe the past because sometimes my memory is fuzzy and I forget who did what, when. God not only forgets what has happened, He knows what will happen. And because He's in the eternal realm, when He says something will happen, you can be sure it will happen just as He has said. It was A.W. Tozer who said, in God there is no was or will be, but a continuous and unbroken is. In Him, history and prophecy are one in the same. We think in the past tense. We think in the future tense. God thinks in the eternal tense. It's all the same to Him. Therefore, the Bible is the one book that dares to predict the future, not once, not twice, but hundreds of times. How does that work? God is omniscient. God knows all things. Therefore, telling the future for Him is nothing. And we look at how the Bible prophesied about how the Messiah would come to us. We see it happen exactly as the Bible said it would. Happen where it would, the Bible said it would happen and so forth. And all the prophecies that were fulfilled. Therefore, when we read what the Bible says about our future, and it has a lot to say about our future, you can know it's going to happen. And a lot of it's being fulfilled before our very eyes right now, isn't it? So the Bible describes the nature of God. It tells us of the omniscience of God. God knows all things. Number two, God is omnipresent. God is omnipresent, which means He is present everywhere. Let's read a few more verses. Verse 7 of Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely darkness will fall on me, even the night will be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Now, these words can be either comforting or frightening depending on what side of the fence you're on. If you're a follower of Jesus, they bring great comfort. As the psalmist has said, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, your hand will lead me. Lord, I'll never be alone. You'll be there no matter where I go. That's great to know. God is not bound by geographical boundaries or time zones. He is present everywhere. And no matter what you're going through, He's there with you. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And in the Greek, that is emphatic. It could be better translated, I will never, no, never, no, never leave you or forsake you. Jesus said, lo, I am with you, even unto the end of the age. Now that's not just a promise for short people. Lo, I am with you. Get it, low, you know, down low. Okay, it wasn't that funny, was it? <laughs> it's for all people that you'll never be alone. What are you going through right now? You're not alone. The omnipresent God is there walking with you through it. We're told over in the book of Isaiah, when you walk through the waters, God speaking, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they'll not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Wherever you go, God is there. C.S. Lewis said, and I quote, We may ignore, but we can nowhere evade the presence of God. The world is crowded with Him. God is with us. Not just when we're in the church worshiping, but when we leave as well. Wherever you go, our God is omnipresent. And also, thirdly, God is omnipotent. God is omnipotent, which means He's all-powerful. Now we've all heard the question, 
Can God do absolutely anything he wants? And then the question that usually follows that assumes the first was answered in, in the affirmative. We'll say, well, yes, he can do anything he wants because God is all powerful. Oh, is that so? Well, can God do anything that is ungodlike? Uh, for instance, can God contradict himself by making uh, something more powerful or more ungodlike than himself? Or the more popular version of the question, can God make a rock so heavy he cannot lift it? Maybe the question ought to be, could God make a person so lame <laughs> they could not think of a better question about God? What, is this supposed to stump us somehow? Like, wow, that's a real brain twister. How do you deal with that? Listen, when we say God is all powerful, it doesn't mean that God will do something that is wrong. God will not do something that is sinful. And we'll talk a little bit more about the nature of God and His attributes in our next message. But God is righteous, God is good, God is holy and so forth. But God will not do something that would contradict His nature. As Scripture says, God cannot deny Himself. Listen, God cannot lie nor can God die. Okay? So what is impossible to God, not that which is difficult to His power, but that which is contrary to His nature. So that's not really saying God can't do something as much as it's saying God won't do something. Let's understand what omnipotence means. Omnipotence means God has infinite power that can never be depleted, drained, or exhausted. Again, omnipotence means God has infinite power that can never be depleted, drained, or exhausted. Now I don't know about you, but I have a phone. It's an iPhone as a matter of fact. And it barely makes it through the day on one charge. Seems about three quarters in the day, uh, my battery's getting low. And then when it hits red, you know, it's trouble. Uh, so I have to go plug it back in again. You know, and we're aware of battery life. We're aware of how much mileage we can get before we need to get the next refuel or refill for our car or truck. But God's Resources are never exhausted. He doesn't have to recharge at night or, or refuel. It's just constant and it never ends. And so that's why it's so ridiculous when someone says, well, I've tried everything and now all I can do is just go pray. Yeah. All you can do now is call out to the omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent creator of the universe. The God who created all things and has named every star and knows about every hair on your head and every bird that falls to the ground. All you can do now is call out to the unlimited God. You see how things change when you put them into perspective? You see, your requirements are never a drain on God's resources. You will never need more than God can supply. The Bible says He is able to do abundantly above and beyond that which you could ask or think. So, consider your circumstances right now. What are you going through? Maybe you're overwhelmed by tragedy or grief or sorrow or confusion or uncertainty or worry. Then again, maybe you're bound by an addiction of some kind. An addiction that has grown so powerful it's turned into a lifestyle and you feel as though you'll never be free from it. I want you to know that the all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present God is here to help you. Don't say God is nowhere. God is now here. God is here to help you. God is here to meet your needs. God is here waiting for you to call out to Him. Is anything too hard for the Lord? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. God can do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. What He's waiting for you to do is to call out to Him. Yes, He is infinite, but He is knowable. So let's break it down. Because I know it's hard to wrap our minds around God, the supreme being. If you want to know what God is like, just look at Jesus. Jesus is God. That's what God is like. And Jesus himself told us a story that we're all very familiar with that gives us a snapshot of God, if you will. We call it the parable of the prodigal son. The Bible doesn't call it that. It may 
be more accurately described the parable of the loving father. Because it's really told more from the father's perspective than the son's. Jesus effectively saying, here's what God is like. A certain man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my portion of the goods that are coming to me. So he divided his estate, and that boy took his money and went off and wasted it all on prodigal living. The boy comes to his senses. He says, hey, my father's hired servants have it better than me. I'm gonna go back and say, Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just take me on as a hired servant. But while he was a Great way off, Jesus said. The father saw him and had compassion on him and ran to him and threw his arms around him and kissed him and hugged him and said, Rejoice with me. This my son who is dead is alive again. He who is lost is found. So what is God like? God's like a father who misses his son. God is like a father who will welcome his son slash daughter back into fellowship with Him, if they'll turn from that sin, God wants to show His affection, His plan, and His purpose to each one of us. That's what God is like. And if Jesus Himself had not said it, it would almost seem irreverent to suggest. But God is like a father who's willing to lose His dignity to get to His Son in time of need. Now let me explain that. In the first century culture, I've told you this before, it was considered undignified for an older man to run. Older men did not run. Just wasn't done. You know, they wore the long robes in those days, so to run you'd have to pull the robe up above your knees. It just wasn't apropos. Not to mention it's hard for an older man to run. I know this from experience. Because I go out running, waiting for the release of endorphins, and I have never met a single endorphin. I don't even believe in endorphins. I was talking to a, a doctor, the father of aerobics, they call him, a wonderful Christian man. His name was Ken Cooper. He has a Cooper clinic in Texas. And, and I asked him, doctor, you gotta tell me about endorphins. Where are they? Where do I find them? I want some. Can you buy them? <laughs> no, he says, you just press on and, and you'll feel them. And I've never experienced, anyway, coming back to the story. Jesus described the father, an older gentleman, willing to lose his dignity, if you will, and run to get to his son. I'm not suggesting God is giving up dignity, but I'll tell you one thing. God gave up the privileges of deity when he walked among us and died on the cross. He never gave up his deity. Jesus never for a moment ceased to be God, but he laid aside the privileges of deity when he came and walked among us and took upon him the form of a servant. This all-powerful, all-knowing God loves you. And he welcomes you into fellowship with him. That's the bottom line. And if you don't know him, if you don't have a relationship with him, then you're gonna go through life alone. And you're gonna face those storms without help. And you're going to have these days of uncertainty with no anchor for your soul. But if you call out to God and be able to say like the Apostle Paul, I believe God, He'll get you through the hardest times. And most importantly, you'll have the guaranteed hope that when you die, you will go to heaven. And I can't think of anything more important than that at all than where you will spend your eternal destiny. Yes, God is omniscient, all-knowing. Yes, God is omnipresent, present everywhere. Yes, God is omnipotent, all-powerful. And that God loves you and wants you to know Him. And if you do not have a relationship with Him, respond now as we close with this prayer. Father, thank You for loving each one of us. Thank You for calling us to Yourself. And now I pray for everyone listening to this message that You will help them to see their need for You and help them to call on Your name. For you have told us in Scripture, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So Lord, help those that do not yet know you to reach out to you. If you want God's forgiveness today, if you want Him to come into your life and forgive you of your sin and transform you from the inside, if you want to know that you will go to heaven when you die, pray this prayer right where you are out loud after me. And this is a prayer of asking Christ to come into your life. Again, as I pray, pray this out loud after me. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. 
but I believe you died on the cross in my place and rose again from the dead. Now I turn from that sin and I choose to follow you as Savior and Lord, as God and friend. Thank you for calling me and accepting me and forgiving me, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.